Hey, this is Dr. Brendan McCarthy. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Protea Medical Center in Chandler, Arizona. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. Welcome. Um, I start every podcast the same way. I want you to know that I spend a lot of time preparing for these because these matter to me. I love doing these podcasts. Um, it gives me a chance to circle back and, and to devote more time researching the things that I do in my practice every day. And when I do that, whenever I research what I do, I always look for the best sources of research. I always look for things to help drive me to learn more and to become better at what I do. It's always important for me to challenge myself with new information. And so whenever I do these podcasts, I want you to know that I keep a list of my sources that will be in the description section at the bottom of the video. Some of you will never look at it. I know that. But some of you, that's what you're all into. And that's great. So it's here for you if you want to look at it. If not, you know, it's just there at the bottom. Um, but yeah, today's subject is important to me. There's a lot of important subjects. This is just one of the big ones. And uh, the producer and I were having a lot of talks about this over the months and I've been preparing for it. I can't just do one episode on this. So there should be a bunch of episodes over the next few months. Not every episode. It won't be like five in a row. But there'll just be every other episode, every few episodes. I'll jump into it again. Um, but it's very specific to, to serotonin. Serotonin is such a fascinating neurotransmitter. And it has so much weight put upon it for what it does and what it doesn't do. And... Um, well, I remember when it first became so popular with SSRIs came out like Prozac and it was a big deal and it, and it should be. Um, but there's been over the years a lot of mixed feelings about it. And even recently, there's a lot of studies showing that, you know, people being treated with an SSRI, it, it didn't help them at all. And other people swear by it. So serotonin is a confusing thing. It, it's, it's more than just mood it, it does so many other things in our bodies uh, a serotonin is actually more prevalent in your intestinal tract believe it or not it plays a huge role in digestion it plays a role with the clotting cascade so your ability to heal wounds that's serotonin centered so so um serotonin is big and i'm going to jump into it just from one aspect now and and like i said i'll, I'll grow it from there so so serotonin <laughs> let me jump over to hear this thing let me change it a little bit, change, change gears a little bit. <laughs> it's a weird question to jump in with, but I'm going to do it. Why do we crave carbohydrates sometimes? <laughs> why do we crave carbohydrates? Why is it that we crave carbs? Um, why is it that some of us are addicted to carbohydrates? Why is it that we crave carbohydrates when we're sad? Why is it we crave, that's a better, I should have led with that question. Why do we crave carbohydrates when we're sad? Why do we crave carbohydrates when everything is down and we're depressed? That's the question. And why is it so hard to give them up for some of us? That's a good one. A lot of times um, we'll think we crave carbohydrates because we're, we're bad. <laughs> we're conditioned to think that we're, you know, uh, a bad person for craving them. You know, there's a lot of shame in there. Um, there's more to the biology of it. And uh, quick little hint is the answer is we crave carbohydrates carbohydrates are comfort food for a reason there's a biological reason diet really influences your uptake and metabolism of serotonin in your body and specifically you know there's some areas where if you're not eating enough certain types of proteins in your diet like tryptophan you're not going to be able to make as much serotonin so tryptophan let me go back here a little bit of biochemistry the way you make serotonin in your body is you go and eat you know like say a turkey sandwich or something there's a lot of tryptophan in there and once you consume that your body will absorb it and then it slowly crosses the blood brain barrier and tryptophan then turns into something called 5-hydroxy tryptophan 5-hydroxy tryptophan turns to serotonin and then ultimately serotonin turns to melatonin by the way so so when you consume tryptophan in your diet it's the direct precursor to your serotonin and then melatonin. That's why you think, I eat turkey, I'm going to go to sleep. You think of the turkey to melatonin. When they say that, they're forgetting all the other cool things that turkey does or tryptophan. Say that does. So when we are deficient in serotonin and when there is a deficiency in our brain or throughout our body, everything's not running well, 
one of the hacks, one of the tricks the body has is that by increasing your glucose levels, by increasing your blood sugar levels and insulin, you could sneak more tryptophan across the blood-brain barrier and generate more serotonin. When you increase your blood sugar, you're in essence trying to medicate your depression. That's why we do it. That's what that is. So we crave carbohydrates as a way to manipulate our mood. And it's something that's subconscious that not everyone has realized. We don't really realize it. We just realize I feel better with that muffin or that cookie or that cracker. It's better. I enjoy that for that reason. And this is why so many people who have depression will notice they crave carbs frequently and all the time. So with uh, another side, interesting fact about this that, that doesn't really get talked about very much is nicotine. And, and nicotine actually does increase your serotonin. It has an impact on serotonin. And when people quit nicotine, serotonin levels drop. That's why people who quit smoking crave carbs and gain weight. It's not because nicotine was increasing metabolism somehow or doing something else weird, suppressing appetite. Nicotine does not suppress appetite. It increases serotonin. Stopping nicotine, you're going to have less serotonin. You're going to crave more carbohydrates. That's what does that. So medically speaking, you know, I could sit here and tell you, well, carbs do this. Carbs are terrible. You're like, well, Brendan, how can we treat it otherwise? What are other ways then that I can helpfully, hopefully, excuse me, increase my, my serotonin levels? Are there natural ways that are going to be, you know, with less consequences for my blood sugar? Yeah. You know, I see clinically and studies show and lab work proves that by improving a person's intake of tryptophan in their diet or actually giving them a supplement of something called 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is the direct precursor to serotonin, and 5-hydroxytryptophan is available in the States as an over-the-counter supplement. I'm not sure about its, its place in uh, other countries. I'm pretty sure in Europe it might be considered a medication. But anyway, in, in America, it's not. And so you'll take in 5-hydroxytryptophan. And, and then sometimes we'll use uh, uh, pyridox, something called pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is an active version of vitamin B6. And we use 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, the precursor to serotonin, with the active version of vitamin B6 called pyridoxal 5-phosphate together. And those things increase your levels of serotonin. By doing that, yes, you can reduce carbohydrate cravings in people. You can improve their serotonin levels. And that could be seen in the literature, as I mentioned. I see it clinically, and I always use lab work to support doing it. So let's take it a little bit deeper. A person who is deficient in serotonin over time will develop a melatonin deficit as well. The same thing, a lot of times you'll see people crave carbs and sugar at night. Why? Remember that? They want to go to bed. So why do I crave why do I crave a cookie or something sweet before bed? Your body's trying to trick yourself into sleep. Now, I'm, I believe when it comes to sleep, it is essential to always target where the problem is with sleep. It's not always melatonin. Okay, there's a lot of other factors in there. It's lazy for a doc just to say, oh, it's just melatonin. Here's your melatonin supplement. And no matter what kind of doctor, it's just lazy. Good medicine requires good work. So when it comes to the serotonin melatonin pathway, it will help if that's where the deficit is to again, increase 5-hydroxytryptophan, the precursor. So that way you can make more serotonin than more melatonin naturally. I don't always need to go straight into melatonin with those cases. Sometimes I don't want to. Because if I start treating just the melatonin, What's going on with their serotonin? Where is that? So we want to run those labs and understand the serotonin levels in the patient and the melatonin patient, the levels in the patient. If the whole pathway is depleted, you start at the beginning of the pathway and fill it out so that way they have improvement in their health all the way through. So here comes another section I'm going to put in here. And, and, I, and I, I want you to know, you're going to hear this part. You're like, that's why he's going to do a lot more podcasts on this subject. I am going to do a lot more on this because it's so important. Last night, I was on the phone with a patient and 
that's just a hard case. It's just a hard case. And you hear me doing these podcasts, it sounds like everything we do just works all the time. And it works a lot. There's some cases that are so complex. And I just sit back and I think about them a lot. There's this one case really on my mind. She has a, it's a serotonin is a big part of it and, and stress and strain in her life. There's a lot of factors in here and, and serotonin is a big one. And, and when I was thinking about getting ready for today, I was thinking about her and I was just thinking about all the ways that serotonin weave through our health. So, um, let me back out again. I went down a tangent. <laughs> what is the biological reason? for us to be having low serotonin there's going to be psychological reasons because you know where mood is distressed from hyper stress and you know running around and, and 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 depression can come from lifestyle and from life experiences we can deplete serotonin through life experience and 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 trauma can do that too um but what other biological pathologies that we want to screen for with low serotonin because it's one thing to see a patient come in who's eating a lot of carbohydrates because their serotonin levels are low and then give them 5-hydroxytryptophan and, and, and pyridoxal-5-phosphate to get it better. But again, that's lazy. A good doctor tries to figure out why are you low in serotonin? If it's because you have a lot of things in your life that are you know, a strain on you with depression, with mood, we refer to therapy always. But what if there's a biological reason? What are the biological reasons? That's my job to find out. So some of the biological reasons, genetics, I'm going to start with that one. Something called MTHFR. Some of you may have heard of it. Not enough, though. I think everyone needs to know about this. Methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Um, Google it. MTHFR. Google it. What that means, bear with me. When you eat food and it has folic acid in it, you need folic acid as a human being, it's important. When you consume folic acid, it gets into your body, but it's not active. It's not active yet. You had to add something onto it called the methyl group to make it active. And that's where you have to have that MTHFR. MTHFR helps your body make active folic acid in your body, okay? So that's what activates it in your metabolism. If you have a genetic deficit with MTHFR, you don't always activate your folate. Some people have both genes broken, and so they really don't methylate very well at all. Some people only have one gene off. They methylate okay. When you don't methylate, you're not going to make as much serotonin. That leads to a lot of people having a ton of other symptoms as well. It's not just depression, as I'm mentioning now, but that is a common cause of low serotonin, is that MTHFR aspect. And treating MTHFR just means giving them an active version of folic acid as a supplement. And if you just right now pause this video or podcast and look up MTHFR in the treatment of depression, you will see just a slew of research supporting this. And what am I mentioning? What am I pushing right now? I'm not pushing anything really, but what am I advocating for? A genetic test, MTHFR? If your insurance covers it, great. If not, I think it's $80 what we charge for that genetic test in our lab. But there's a lot of other companies that do genetic testing. It could be even cheaper. But that's me using like LabCorp. I think it's 84 bucks at LabCorp, right? And if you're low in it, what am I then advocating for? Methylfolate as a supplement. That's not hard to take. It's easy. You just take the right amount. So one common cause of serotonin deficiency, MTHFR genetics. Great thing to figure out. Great thing to treat. Another one is going to be those patients whose diets are just funky. You know, and, 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 and I'm going to get into that in the next podcast, I think, talking about diet. Some of us don't eat protein very well. And we're, we're very picky about the type of proteins we consume. We're picky about our foods. And I see it, not often, but I see it enough where people have tryptophan deficiencies in their diet. So, so it's important on the part of the physician is to do a full breakdown of your diet to understand if you have a deficiency in tryptophan in your diet. Because I'd rather you eat the tryptophan in your food than take a supplement. Honestly, so do you. You know, you want to know what's causing this. 
if you're having depression because of low tryptophan in your diet, how awesome is it to treat it by just fixing your diet rather than taking a medication or a supplement? So that's another one. Another one that I've mentioned before in previous podcasts, but I'm circling back to again, and it's just my, my wheelhouse, is when you have too much estrogen. So when women have estrogen dominance, excess levels of estrogen, which is when their estrogen should be at a certain level here, but it's way up here instead, and that does happen, that inhibits your ability to make serotonin. That inhibits the monoamine pathway. That's the pathway where it takes tryptophan into serotonin and ultimately melatonin. So that's why women who don't ovulate at every cycle will find themselves having more depression because excessive serotonin, excuse me, excessive levels of estrogen oppose the production of serotonin. Hand in hand with that goes progesterone. When you have adequate levels of progesterone in your body, you will make adequate levels of serotonin if that's the cause of the pathology. So balancing a woman's estrogen and progesterone helps with serotonin. If you doubt that, Talk to a woman who has PMS. That's where the depression comes from in PMS. Run the labs. Women who are depressed around their period have low progesterone, high estrogen, or just high estrogen, or just low progesterone. But it's a variance of those things. So they play a role. It's important to, to balance that. Again, circling back, just giving the woman, just giving her a 5-hydroxytryptophan, and pyridoxal 5-phosphate, B6, is not enough. You want to know why this is happening. Normalize those hormones, okay? And then another one is low nutrition. And I, it's different from, okay, different types of malnutrition. There's going to be a macronutrient malnutrition where someone's not eating enough protein or fat or carbohydrates or all three. And then there's going to be a micronutritional deficiency where the foods they eat doesn't have enough vitamins and minerals in it. That's those empty calories you hear about. And that's a truth. You're seeing higher and higher incidences of people having adequate calorie intake, but there's no nutrition in the food they're eating. So they have vitamin B6 deficits. If you don't have enough vitamin B6 in your diet, you're not going to take that tryptophan from your diet and convert it all the way down the pathway to serotonin and then melatonin. Another thing in here is kind of sneaky. Women who have high levels of estrogen require a lot of vitamin B6 to metabolize that estrogen. So that kind of fits in with it as well. So again, hormones and nutrients and, and, and genetics. These are big things we're going to screen for. So to sum things up, craving carbohydrates is not a character defect. I hate this stuff. I see when people get shamed. Hey, listen, shame is not a good um, way to inspire change in anyone ever. (laughs) It just isn't. It doesn't work. Understanding the person, being curious about the person in front of you works. It works. So so being curious about to why someone is craving carbohydrates, I think is essential to fixing the problem. Okay? Um, Low serotonin, can come from a lot of different things, as I mentioned. Fixing it doesn't just mean giving you more serotonin through supplementation or even prescribing. Fixing it means understanding the cause and treating the cause, always. I hope this helped. Your comments mean everything to me. I appreciate them. Your input helps me guide what I do here. I read them. I really do. Um... So it matters to me. So please do post. Please do share. Uh, Please do subscribe. Thanks for tuning in and I will see you next time.